I'll give it just one or two more minutes to see if anybody else wants to jump on and then we'll get going. So how's everybody doing today? Kind of a crazy time. This is our first real full day that we're supposed to stay at home, um, at least here in the state of Indiana. What do you guys think about that? It's not gonna be easy. You know, we are social creatures, but it's doable and it's the right thing to do because it's our job to protect our loved ones and our community. Um, we just had our first case announced yesterday here in the county I live in, in Indiana. And um, it's a little scary. It's hitting a little close to home. Um, but you know what? The Bible tells us over and over and over again not to worry. We aren't gonna add any more to our days. It's not gonna change anything if we worry. And it's certainly not gonna make the situation better if we worry. I've said this over and over and over again. Should we be taking precautions? Yes, absolutely. But we can't sit and dwell on this, guys. Um, Love your family, be with your family, love your neighbors, see if your neighbors need anything. I know my neighbors here around us um, are in the very vulnerable population. So, you know, it's about taking care of our neighbors. It's practicing social distancing. Um, and I know this is something that that I've kind of struggled with, and so has my husband, um, over this whole state mandate. Who's essential and who's a non-essential worker? Um, and we have very conflicting feelings with this. Um, he has to go to work. His job says they're essential. Do we necessarily think that? No. But that's not for us to judge we need to feel blessed just that he can still bring money in that that he can be considered essential i know i've seen several uh people talking about who's essential and that nothing has really even changed um but the, be thankful guys be thankful that we still have income and we can still take care of our families in this time um, while still trying to protect ourselves. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. We are going to take a trip to NASA today. And I'm gonna see how I can do this. And hold tight guys, technical difficulties. So we're gonna open a new window and do it that way. So let me go back here and fix this so you guys can see the right thing. There we go. Let's see what we have now.
So I've kind of looked into these a little bit already and they look kind of cool. So we're gonna start where they keep, it's called the hanger. And we'll watch a video and hopefully you guys can hear this okay. I apologize, there is no audio to this one. Um, it's just a series of slideshow of pictures of when they were building the hangar. That's pretty cool. Reminds me a lot of the hangar down in Fort Wayne. Let's see what else we have. Oh, I forgot. We can do 360 view. Those cars look a whole lot different, don't they? Pretty sky. And this is named the Glenn Research Center. It's named after the astronaut John Glenn. Yeah, those cars definitely look a whole lot different. Let's see what the information has to say. Also known as the Flight Research Building, the hangar is 65 by 250 feet heated facility that houses numerous aircraft for the purpose of scientific research and aeronautical test purposes. Let's go in. Hi, welcome to the Hangar Machine Shop. We use this area to build, repair, and inspect aircraft parts, as well as to mount our research sensors. There are various machines for drilling holes, for cutting stock, for milling to shape, and turning parts. Those parts could then be inspected and later installed in an aircraft. We have the ability to make everything from small brackets to reskinning an airplane. Not only are these tools used for the aircraft, but they're also used to support special research projects around the lab. We do all this to keep our aircraft flying safely and to enable us to meet our research objectives. That's pretty cool. Let's go to this video. That looks slightly terrifying. Oh, I'm. this must be where they try zero gravity, where they go really high and they come right back down. Kind of simulates zero gravity. Microgravity, that's what they call it. Let's read that again. To support microgravity research, the center leased this DC-9 in the early 90s and removed the seats, installed extensive instrumentation, and a guidance system. Over a period of two, three hour, two to three hours, the aircraft would climb and dive an average of 30 times to simulate 20 seconds of microgravity for passengers and test equipment. Wow. That's pretty cool. What's this picture? I don't know if you guys can see that well. This says historic flight research aircraft, a consolidated B-24D Liberator, which is the plane on the left, Boeing B-29 Superfortress, which is the plane in the background, and Lockheed RA-29 Hudson, which is in the foreground, parked inside the Flight Research Building in 1944. A P-47G Thunderbolt and a P-63A King Cobra are visible in the background. The laboratory utilizes 15 different aircraft during the final two and a half years of the World War II. Interesting. Hammer pod, 
which attaches to the S-3B Viking aircraft, holds a variety of flight experiments, such as sensors and communicators, or communications flight monitoring equipment. Equipped with small windows, as well as open bottom ports, the pod is 200 inches long and 42 inches in diameter, and can hold over 1,000 pounds of cargo. That's a lot. That's half a ton. Let's finish looking around and then we'll go over this way. Oh, here's another video. That's pretty cool looking. Air Force planes. Hope these pictures aren't turning out too grainy when I blow them up for you guys. Let's see what the information. The Twin Otter is ideal for icing research purposes because of its ability to be flown in adverse weather conditions. However, the air aircraft's configuration can be easily altered to accommodate a vast array of airborne science missions. Oh, this is cool. We get to see inside it. The Twin Otter is a versatile aircraft capable of flying various missions with an array of instruments. The aircraft has instruments mounted, in, has inter, instrument mounts on both wings as well as numerous fuselage mounting points. It is an economical aircraft for missions flown below 20,000 feet at speeds of around 90 to 140 knots. Oh, I bet this is a cool video. So I work on the hyperspectral imaging here at NASA Glenn, and we use an imager that we built in-house to look at the algae in the lake. So when we fly over collecting data, it used to take us several passes to look at, at the algae. So I worked on a system that optimized our configuration to improve our field of view to to reduce the number of passes that we take to fly over the lake that's pretty cool the back of the twin otter is outfitted with monitors computer stations and research control equipment for up to two researchers let's see what this video says the twin otter was used to gather important data for many different icing flights research pro projects over the years, such as characterizing ice clouds and how the super cool large drops led to aerodynamic icing conditions on aircraft. During these projects, researchers flew into icing conditions, monitored the ice growth on the airplane, and performed test maneuvers to define the degraded performance, stability, and control with that level of ice. Oh, let's go back to the video, sorry. That's a little scary if you ask me. Okay. See what else we can see. Exploring the moon's darkest craters requires a reliable, efficient power source independent of the sun. Kilopower, a new power system being developed at NASA, could provide the energy required for living on and exploring the surface of the moon and beyond.
In the hangar, researchers assembled a kill power unit before sending it for testing at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in 2018. That's pretty interesting. Oh, we already watched the machine shop. Sorry. Getting a little turned around here. The 34C Mentor. Oop. Oh is a military training aircraft that NASA uses as a low-cost te test platform for small experiment experiments such as sensor training, communications research, and for unmanned aerial vehicles and algae bloom monitoring. Well, that's kind of cool. Here is the inside of it. Wow. The inside of the aircraft features a small two-person tandem seat, the pilot up front and the researcher behind, with high visibility for observation. That's pretty cool. Wow. I think I would get a little lost and confused with all those. Well, that's as far as it's letting us go. See what the video is. Research flights. These are pictures, it looks like, from the researcher in the back. You could see the pilot's head out front. Very cool. I love flying. Love, love flying. And uh, seeing everything from up top and just looking down. Researchers have used the T-34C Mentor to validate sensors that are planned for unmanned vehicles. The operator has the ability to remotely control the sensor or operate it from the back seat during the flight. Okay, what else did we forget? Did we go, th I don't believe we... No, we didn't go here. Added to Glenn's fleet of research aircraft in 2005, engineers from NASA, Boeing, and the Navy transformed the S-3B into a state-of-the-art NASA research aircraft. The S-3B Viking is equipped to conduct science and aeronautics missions, such as environmental monitoring, satellite communications, testing and aviation safety research, it can fly up to 40,000 feet high and reach speeds faster than 500 miles per hour. Could you imagine? Wow. Let's go inside. Oh, I thought the other plane was bad. Look at all this, guys. Let's view this video. Not quite sure. That looks like a communications tower that they're setting up. Could you imagine the view of that pilot? Wow.
can't imagine the amount of experience you would need to fly one of these or to do research. Ah, uh, yep, that's a communication tower there. The Vikings interior, while primarily designed and used by the U.S. Navy as a carrier-based aircraft, NASA modified the avionics to integrate with the National Airspace for Science Research. Wowie zowie. Algae bloom research. Let's see what this is. I wish we could be in that pilot seat to watch them fly up while they're beginning their takeoff. I think that'd be super interesting. They just need to attach a GoPro to somebody. Wow, look at all that, guys. They have cameras so they can see. GPS, that's GPS right there. That's some land and some water. I believe it said this was Lake Erie they were flying over. NASA Glenn and the researchers from federal labs and universities have teamed up to understand the toxic algae blooms occurring in the western basin of Lake Erie. Using a hyperspectral imager attached to the aircraft, regular flights are capturing, capturing Lake Erie's algae blooms across the light spectrum to understand the environmental and human health threat. Go back the other way. Wow. That's not so. Oh, even look on the ceiling, guys. See, there's a camera there. Why won't they let us see? But can you imagine that view? Holy cow. I couldn't even imagine. Being able to see all that way around us. Okay. Go back out. I think we have seen everything we can see in here. Let's see if I can find something cool for us to look at. I kind of am interested in this ballistics impact. Big booms, guys. Oh, I don't know if they have any videos here. Oh, yes, they do. Okay. So let's just start here. And this is part of the ballistic lab or this part of the ballistic lab features a 40 foot long large gas gun with barrels from 8 to 16 inches in diameter and numerous smaller guns mat matted to vacuum chambers or mated to vacuum chambers. Impact velocities range from 2,000 to 3,000 feet per second. Wow. Depending on the weight of the projectiles. The results of this test help scientists and engineers make lighter, more fuel efficient, and safe aircraft and space structures. Kind of like it reminds me of a potato gun. Three ton cranes are used for lifting each component to reconfigure the gas guns for different tests. That's exactly what this is. So, this is a crane, and these big long tubes are basically potato guns. Loading a small gas gun. 
A three inch gas gun is inserted into the large gun barrel to shoot a projectile to test the strength of advanced composite material. Smaller gas guns are sometimes used to accommodate smaller projectiles. Ooh, I wanna do this. High speed cameras. Why did it not pull up? Oh, they must be saying this is a high speed camera. So this is watching what's going on. Researchers use a series of high speed cameras to track and document projectile impacts on test articles. Oh, this is so cool. All right, let's watch this video. The large 40 foot long gas gun is configured in a variety of ways to match the needs of the experiment. The black pneumatic accelerator blow right is a gas gun that accelerates steel or aluminum block that impacts a test article. Oh, well, I didn't get, well, that's hard to read that fast. I'm not gonna try that. I would like to watch them test this, really, or test something in this, actually. The pressure vessel for the large gas gun is typically pressurized with helium or nitrogen and can propel projectiles to a maximum velocity of 3,000 feet a second. Holy camolies, guys. The Mylai burst disc contains the gas in the pressurized vessel. The gun is fired by running current through a small electrical wire taped to the disc. The mylar melts and releases the gas in the pressure vessel. Oh, this is my kind of potato gun, folks. The control room. In the control room, engineers manage the entire experiment from pressurizing the gas gun to triggering the projectile and camera rigs. Can I just run that, please? Oh, yes. Let's go up here. During an experiment, projectiles are placed in a sabot or can before they are shot through the gas gun. When the spot reaches the end of the shaft, it hits a stopper plate and the projectile continues to the target area. Woo, look at that. Impact plate. This half inch thick aluminum plate shows damage from a projectile traveling approximately 1500 miles per hour. The sabot arrestor is a steel case at the end of the gun, which stops the aluminum sabot, but allows the projectile to continue towards the project, towards the target. Wow. I'm a little excited. Fuselage impact test. The model of a composite aircraft fu fuselage section, including the frames, fasteners, and stringers, was impacted at high velocity with aluminum projectiles to measure its response. The test article was impacted multiple times at different locations, requiring dismounting and relocating it between each impact. Let's watch this. So this would be like the outside of an aircraft. Say a space shuttle or an airplane or something like that. Wow. Can you guys see where the target's hitting? Let's see if I can point it. These spots here are where the target has hit. Oh, that was kind of cool. I want to see it actually do it in slow-mo, though. When drones crash, 
Investigating the impact energy of two different drone designs during flight helps researchers make drones safer in the event of a crash. The top drone is made of a rigid composite. The other is a foam composite. Wow. That bottom one just got smooshed. That's so cool, though. I'm really a science nerd at heart, folks. Impact test preparations. Whoop. Okay, let's just watch this one. Oh, such a tease. I want more people. The high-speed cameras require ample lighting for adequate exposure of the digital video. High-intensity LED lamps are used to flood the test chamber with light during the test. Yeah, lighting is super, super important to photography and to videography. Imaging data acquisition. Tests are documented with high-speed digital video cameras. Stereo imaging and instrumentation measures measure defor deformation and response of the test articles. Wow, you can look on the ceiling and see where shrapnels hit the ceiling. Same way with the walls. Look at the walls. You can see where there's been bits and pieces come off and hit the walls. Oh, yeah. Look at it right there, guys. Must be why they have this big, heavy door that they closed during the testing. Could you imagine? There's a good look at the cameras. Let me get a closer look at the lighting. So these are the lights. Okay, I think that's going to be all for today, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments. And I will see you guys next week. I think we may do Shed Aquarium next week. Let me know if you guys have any suggestions or um, things that you want to research and, and do virtual tours on. Uh, until then, I'll see you later. Bye, guys.